and we get to talk about sex this morning because that is the topic of Proverbs chapter 5. And while that is, that just made everybody uncomfortable, uh, it is an appropriate topic for us to talk about for a couple of reasons. One, we live in a highly sexualized culture. We live in a culture that has placed sex at a high value and high premium and spread it across the culture in all kinds of ways and in places where it's not meant to be, but it's basically everywhere. And it is in front of us in the culture quite a lot. But we live in a culture that has a disordered view of sex. And I'm using that word intentionally because it is therefore incumbent upon us as believers to come back to a biblical view of sex, which is an ordered view of sex. That is, God has created sex in his order of creation. There is a context for it. There is a right place for it. But our culture has disordered that. It has disconnected it from truth, from scripture, from God, and has elevated it to something that it was not ever meant to be and placed it in an arena in which it cannot fulfill what it promises. If we go back to Genesis 1 and 2, we find there that God has created and what God created was good. That is, God created man and woman. He created the man first, and the man was alone. And it's interesting that the man didn't necessarily know that he was alone, but God brings all of the, all of the animals before him, and there's no suitable helper found for him. And it's, it's interesting. The man, it's not told us whether Adam recognizes this loneliness. It, it's just, we're told that this is the case. But God has something better for him. God has something different for him. And so he creates woman. And he brings the woman to the man. And the two become one flesh. And what God has joined together, let no one separate. And God tells them that they are to be fruitful and multiply. And so in this context of creation that is good, God has created man and woman in this monogamous covenant relationship where the two join together and are not to be separated. And this is where sex and procreation are given in that context. And so all of those elements are necessary for ordered sexuality. One man, one woman in a covenant relationship, monogamous covenant relationship for life, where the two become one flesh for the purpose of creating family. This is all part of the con biblical context of sex. This is how God created it in the context in which he created it for the purposes of fulfilling what he gave them to do. To remove any of these pieces is to begin to take apart what God has created and to disorder what God has ordered. So to take it outside of the context of male and female is to disorder God's creation of sex, God's establishment of it. To take it out of monogamous marriage is to disorder it. To take children out of the, crea of the, of the purpose, of the possibility, the creation of family is to disorder it. That is not to say that sex is only for the purpose of procreation, but our culture has divided those two ideas. Which is why we struggle so much with abortion. 
in our culture because we've divorced the procreative act and the, the production, the creation of children from the purpose of that union together. So we're talking about two very different views of sex and sexuality and the purpose and context of it. An ordered biblical view and a disordered cultural view. Jesus then goes on to affirm the biblical created ordered view of sex in Matthew 19 when he talks about God has created the male and female. What God has joined together, let no man separate. He affirms the biblical created order of this. Paul then goes on to affirm this as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul is communicating this inside the context, the larger context of the church setting. And the Corinthians have written Paul about some of these things, and so he writes back. He says, concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Which seems like an odd statement for Paul to start out with, but he's speaking of it in this context of the things they wrote to him. What do we do, Paul, about sex and sexuality? This is a very real human issue. It was an issue not just for today, but it was an issue back then. What do we do about this? And Paul says, there is a created order for sex and its expression, and it is inside the marriage of a man and a woman, period. So it's good for a man not to touch a woman, unless you do it in the context of marriage relationship, he goes on to say. Let each man have his own wife, let each woman have her own husband. That's the context for sex. Let the husband fulfill his duty to his wife, likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, also, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again, lest Satan tempt you because of your lack of self-control. That is, there's a mutuality in the marriage relationship of the need for and expression of and enjoyment of and providing of and fulfillment of sex. God created them this way, male and female, to be united in a monogamous covenant relationship that no one is to interfere with, that no one is to separate. Inside that that is where sex and sexuality is to be enjoyed and expressed mutually between husband and wife. Now, Paul goes into some other things here. We won't get into those this morning. But he, he reaffirms here what Jesus affirmed and what God created, that this is the context, this is the created order of the expression of sex and sexuality within a covenant, monogamous, heterosexual relationship, period. This is God's design. Anything else is disordered. Paul goes on to talk about singleness. Singleness, Paul says, is a good thing. If you have the, what has been termed among church circles as the gift of singleness, if Paul is saying here, basically, if you do not feel the need for the expression and engagement in sexual activity, then you can remain single. And that gives you certain opportunities. Nothing wrong with singleness, Paul says. In fact, it provides particular advantages for being available to, for ministry and the work of God. But otherwise, be married. If you have a need for, a desire to engage in sexual activity, you must get married because that's the only context in which it is allowed. So marriage is good, 
singleness is good, but this is the context in which the Bible understands God's gift of or creation of the expression of sex. Now, back to Proverbs. Because the father here, again, talking to his son, is going to express himself in terms of what the son needs to be aware of so that he can avoid certain things and engage in other things. Now, again, this is the father speaking to his son regarding, he'll talk about regarding the adulterous woman and regarding the wife that he either is looking for or has found. We could flip this around and talk to the daughter in regards to an adulterous man or the husband she has found. So we're not limited here to one side. This just, the father speaking to his son is the means by which this is presented. So he begins here in the first two verses, my son, give attention to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding, that you may observe discretion, and your lips may reserve knowledge. He's going to contrast this to the lips of the adulterous woman. But what the son is to hear, he is therefore to know, so that he can therefore speak. He is to hear, is to pay attention to what the Father is saying so that he can internalize it, so that he knows it, so that he can then speak it, so that he can externalize it in his actions and speech and behavior over and against what the adulterous woman is going to say. So in a larger setting, in a larger context or thinking for us, the culture is going to speak and act. We need, as believers, we need to be able to speak and act in response or in defense or in opposition to at times. What do we say? What do we do? It should be based on Scripture. We are to listen to the words of the Bible. We're to listen to the words of God so that we can know them, so that we can then speak them especially in the face of what the culture is going to say, what the adulterous woman is going to say. For she is going to speak here, verse 3, the lips of an adulteress drip honey, and smoother than oil is her speech. So I've, I like to think about this in terms of what disordered sex promises. It promises honey. It presents itself enticingly. It looks good. It sounds good. It tastes good. It feels good. It presents itself in a beautiful package. It is tempting. The father is warning his son... The scriptures are warning us the temptation is coming. You therefore need to be prepared to speak and act in light of it, in front of it, against it, out of what you know because you've paid attention to the words of God. But this is what it promises. But, verse 4, it cannot deliver on its promises. In the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. What was presented as sweet as honey eventually turns to bitter wormwood. What was smooth and felt good to the touch is now the sharp edge of a two-edged sword that cuts and does damage. So we have what disordered sex 
promises versus what it delivers. It cannot deliver what it promises. Why is that? Because her path is disordered. It is at odds with the created order, and it therefore leads to destruction. Verse 5, her feet go down to death, her steps lay hold of Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life, her ways are unstable, and she does not know it. Those who abandon God's way, those who abandon his path, those who abandon truth, wander aimlessly because they have no reference point. They are lost, wandering through the world in a moral and spiritual and physical and emotional wilderness, unable to distinguish between right and wrong, and unable to find fulfillment and rest and peace. It's like the Israelites wandering the wilderness if God had not gone with them. Wandering the wilderness looking for food, looking for water, looking for fulfillment, looking for rest and peace, and there is none to be offered there. And they're lost. And this is what the world is. Is doing. This is what those who have disengaged from the truth of God are wandering the world without a reference point. And they don't even know it. But they cannot find fulfillment. They cannot find purpose. They cannot find rest or peace. They're looking for it. They're looking for the same things we all are but they cannot find them. And so they grab onto one thing and try that for a while, and ultimately it proves hollow. They try something else, and it eventually proves empty. They try sex outside of marriage, outside of God's ordered idea, and it doesn't work either. Eventually it leads to destruction. It leads to emptiness, it leads to loneliness, it leads to nothingness and ultimately death because there is nothing there. The lies that it tells that sex is the basis for a good marriage or sexual fulfillment is the primary goal in life or sexual fulfillment can be found outside of a covenant marriage relationship or any of the other lies that are told, all of them start out as honey, end up in bitterness, end up in paths wandering in the wilderness and to destruction. So the father warns his son The scriptures warn us as people of the word. And he continues in verse 7, Now then, my sons, listen to me, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. That's pretty straightforward, and it's pretty good advice. Hear my words and keep them. Temptation is coming. When I was working as a teacher and coach, I had opportunity oftentimes to speak to young people, especially groups of young men. And I would make, try to at least, make this point to them. Temptation is coming. Make up your mind before you get there what you're going to do. And in the case of talking to these young men about dating and sex and so forth, I would stress that point to them. The time to make up your mind about what you're going to do is not when you're sitting alone with this pretty young girl, alone in the dark on the couch or in the back seat of a car, or wherever. 
That is not the point in time to start thinking about, I wonder how far we should go. I wonder what I should do. I wonder if... That's not the time to make that decision, is it? Because your brain has left the building. <laughs> and your hormones have taken the driver's seat. The time to make that decision is beforehand. The father is telling his son, the scriptures are telling us, temptation is coming. Make up your mind now. What are you going to do if this? What are you going to do in the face of this? What are you going to do when presented with the adulterer? What are you going to do when you are tempted to step outside of God's design for sexual fulfillment? Before marriage, outside of marriage, what are you going to do with this person, with that person, with pornography? The temptation is coming. The warning here is very straightforward. Don't go near her door. Decide now knowing her door is there, that you will not approach her door. That you will walk away. That you will turn and go the other direction. That you will avoid that street. What do you need to do to avoid that? The Father wisely warns us ahead of time. The temptation is real. The temptation is out there. The temptation is coming. What will you do? You need to decide ahead of time. So that, as much as possible, you avoid it, you stay away from it. And you make up your mind so that when you are Joseph and Potiphar's wife reaches out to grab you, you know you've already decided what I do in this situation is I run away as fast as I can. What I do in this situation is I turn the phone off and go and do something else. What I do in this situation is I say no and I turn around and walk away. The temptation is real. The temptation is coming. Decide now to avoid it. He then goes on with verses 9 through 14. This is what disordered sex costs you. Lest you give your vigor to others. That is, if you go into her door, you will end up giving your vigor to others and your years to the cruel one. Lest strangers be filled with your strength and your hard-earned goods go to the house of an alien. And you groan at your latter end when your flesh and your body are consumed and you say, how I have hated instruction and my heart spurned reproof. I've not listened to the voice of my teachers nor inclined my ears to my instructors. I was almost in utter ruin in the midst of the assembly and the congregation. It will cost you everything. Giving your honor, your dignity, your strength, your money, your standing in the community, Broken marriages, broken families, all of these are in the wake of adultery. And this is the context in which he's talking about this to his son. What will adultery cost you? It will cost you everything. Eventually, all of it comes crashing down. Eventually, what was done in secret becomes known. And it destroys lives, and it destroys children, and it destroys spouses, and it destroys families, and it leaves destruction in its wake. He talks about, it, interestingly here, your honor, your dignity, your standing in the community, all that becomes known. And he's talking here in the context of the Israelite nation, where this would be handled in the midst of the community by the community when this was found out. There were penalties for adultery. There were death penalties for adultery in certain circumstances. 
certainly there is going to be destruction of families and marriages. Certainly your standing in the community will be affected by this. In some accounts and in some situations, the man who committed adultery could become a slave to the husband of the woman he committed adultery with. But regardless of the specifics, there's going to be destruction. And you're going to be left, not only giving all of that away, but groaning at the end when your flesh and your body are consumed by sin. Looking back, saying, if only, if only I had listened, if only I had listened and paid attention. Groaning in guilt and shame, loneliness, humiliation and depression, if only I had listened. I have yet to meet anyone who on the other side of sexual sin said, you know what, in the end, it was worth it. Never met one. The destruction is real. This is what it costs. Then we get to verses 15 to 19. If verses 9 to 14, one commentator put it this way, 9 to 14 are keep your hands off other women. 15 to 19 are keep your hands on your wife. So 9 to 14 is disordered sex. Keep your hands off. Keep your eyes away from. Avoid disordered sex. 15 to 19 is ordered sex. Enjoy this. This is where it belongs. He uses two metaphors here. One is water and the other are animals. But he says, drink water from your own cistern and fresh water from your own well. Should your springs be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be yours alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. He uses here this idea of water, and this is again in Israel where water was a scarce commodity and springs of water were something to rejoice over. So drink your own water not the foreign waters, not someone else's waters. Drink your own. Should your springs then be dispersed to others? No. They are yours to enjoy. Let them be yours alone and not for strangers. Let your fountains be a blessing or be blessed. In 19, he shifts to an animal metaphor, as a loving hind and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. This is a common metaphor in the ancient Near East. We see it in the Song of Songs. What is the idea here? The metaphor of refreshing waters, the metaphor of enjoying all of this. The, he urges the son to find sexual satisfaction in his wife. Notice the words that he uses here, be blessed, rejoice in, satisfy you at all times, be exhilarated or intoxicated always with. He uses both quality and quantity ideas here. But simply speaking, what is he telling us? He's telling us what we knew from Genesis 1 and 2. God created man and woman to be joined together and to enjoy sexual activity in a marriage relationship, to be satisfied and to fulfilled in that, to enjoy it, to be intoxicated with it. It's a good thing in its proper context. And there and there alone is it to be engaged in and enjoyed. And so he is encouraging the son. He's encouraging the people of God. This is where you enjoy it. 
This is what it was created for. This is where you seek that kind of fulfillment. And it should be enjoyed. As Paul says, and we looked in briefly in 1 Corinthians 7, mutually fulfilling from both sides. Now again, he's talking here from the big picture. We're not dealing with all of the issues and complications and so forth, but this is the ideal. This is the way God created it. And so he is comparing and contrasting here. Avoid the adultery. Avoid any sex outside of the created context of marriage. Inside the context of marriage, be satisfied. Enjoy it. Find your fulfillment there. Be intoxicated with it. This is where God created it to be enjoyed. And then as he draws this to a conclusion, He reminds again, verse 20, Why should you, my son, be exhilarated with an adulteress and embrace the bosom of a foreigner? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he watches all his paths. His own iniquities will capture the wicked, and he will be held with the cords of his sin. He will die for lack of instruction, and in the greatness of his folly he will go astray. He brings this to a conclusion with these two ideas, God's omniscience and God's justice. God's omniscience and God's justice. God's omniscience, I think, because oftentimes we think we can do these things in secret. We think we can get away with this sin and hide it away from everyone and they will not find out. But that's not true, is it? Because God knows. And God brings justice. God brings discipline. The folly of Ignoring the instructions of God is evident. Part of the problem is we take one step away and it leads us to a second step and it leads us to a third and pretty soon we're so far down the path we're lost. The father wants to instruct his son, get his son's attention. He wants to get our attention with, don't dip your toe in the forbidden stream. Don't step one foot down the wrong path. Don't start toward her door. Because I know where that leads. And you don't want to go there, he tells his son. God knows where that leads, and he doesn't want you to go there. So what are we to do in response? What are we to do with a chapter like this? Some of us are married, some of us are not married. Some of us want to be married. Some of us aren't thinking about it. What do we do with this? Well, first of all, in li- especially in light of the times in which we live, we need to be reminded of the truth of ordered versus disordered sex. The truth of how God has created it. And in the context of between a man and a woman in a monogamous, committed marriage relationship, which is not to be separated. (laughs) 
with the reality of procreation, in that context, God has created sex. And in that context, it is good. In that context alone, is it to be enjoyed? Is it found to be fulfilling? Interestingly, all of the research data supports this. Go look at all of the research data on sex and sexuality and who has sex and who has the most sex and who enjoys it the most and finds it the most fulfilling and et cetera, et cetera. It is heterosexual married people. Outside of that context is disordered sex. Now, why do we need to be made aware of that? Because our culture is inundating us with the idea that disordered sex is good. We need to know the truth. We need to remind ourselves of the truth. We need to be able to remind one another of the truth. We need to help those who are married to stay on this path. We need to help those who are hoping to be married to understand this truth. We need to help those outside to be able to understand this truth. That there is no sexual fulfillment outside of God's design. We need to be able to listen to the words of the Father, the words of Scripture here, and apply them to our conversations, to our attitudes, to where we go, to what we see, to how we speak with our spouses, with our children, with our grandchildren, with one another. We need a biblical view of sex in the church because there's not one anywhere else. And a disordered, unbiblical view of sex leads destruction in its wake. For the believer and the unbeliever, it leads to destruction in life. There is no way around that. We need to be people with a biblical view of sex. Let me pray for us. Father, as we stop to think about it this morning, it, is, it becomes increasingly clear that the world around us, the culture around us, has a very unbiblical and disordered view of sex and sexuality. We live in a world that prioritizes all the wrong things about it. And most of the people around us have no understanding of what is wrong with that and why it doesn't work. As they move from one thing to another, seeking fulfillment and finding emptiness. And too often, we in the church, we as believers, can begin to allow those ideas and those concepts to seep into our thinking and what's wrong with this, or why not that? And our urges and our desires can be led astray. Father, bring us back to a biblical view of sex. Of how you have designed it to be satisfying and fulfilling within the context of one man and one woman for life. of the purpose of bringing satisfaction and bringing children and creating families and providing that mutual fulfillment together.
so that we as your people might be those who have not only proper views of sex, but fulfilling and satisfying sexual lives within a biblical context. That we might celebrate what you have given and enjoy it as you designed it. That we might pass these truths on to those around us, those who come along behind us, that they might find truth and live accordingly. That we might be examples to those both inside and outside the church of these truths, of these realities, of how you have designed sex to work. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.